What's up guys, so I'm finally back and I have some time to put out some videos so I want to be able to bring you some deck profiles. I know I promised these when RDE was like first coming out but I've been super busy with everything going on. But I'm really excited to put out this deck profile because Kaguya is like by far possibly the most fun deck I've ever played. It's just like so like cool to swing with so much damage at all the kimonos and everything and it just feels really 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 cool. So I'm not going to waste anyone's time, normally I talk a lot in the beginning, but uh, I want to get straight into the deck profile so you guys get to see it without having to wait too much. So, um, Kaguya is of course the ruler for this deck, uh, she has one effect and it's really great. Uh, she gets to pay zero to look at the top card of her deck, and if it's a treasury item you can put it into your hand. And then she of course energizes for blue and green, and she can judgment for zero as long as a uh, treasury entered the field that turn. So. Typically, the idea around how you play this deck is you use your effect every turn to just keep adding kimonos to your hand uh, and other treasury items and then playing them onto the field uh, to buff up your monsters and swing for game. Uh, but of course, there's a little bit more com complexity that goes into it because of her J ruler side. So to simplify her in the, like, the most easiest way I can, I guess, is Kaguya has five effects on this side. Uh, the first one is if you tap one treasury item, she gives a resonator or a J resonator a minus 200 attack. If she taps two of them, she can float either blue or green mana. If she floats, I mean, if she taps three treasuries, she can um, draw a card. And if she does four, it's bounce a monster to the opponent's hand, or it's any monster actually, so you get to do your resonators or their resonators. And then if it's five, she becomes 15, 15 and flying. Um, that's typically the one that I feel is hardest to pull off. Not that you never have like five treasuries on the field, because that happens really quickly, but it's more of like, I never want to tap out on five unless I have five open on my draw, let's say and then swing for 15 and then leave 5 open, but unless it's for game, I never like tapping out on my treasuries and then ending my turn so my opponent knows that I'm tapped out on them. I really like leaving it kind of like a control E deck where you would just um, sit behind Kaguya and just use your effects like the way, like depending on how your opponent's reacting. So like, you know, you leave them open and if you need to bounce, you bounce. If you didn't need to bounce, and you need to float mana, you float mana. If you didn't need to do either of those, on your draw phase, you can, you know, draw your card and then use your effect uh, on before your recovery to draw more cards by tapping three with her draw effect and then recover and then have more cards to kind of use at this turn. So I don't like the 15-15 effect unless it's like either for game or if I'm doing it because I had mana open, but in almost every scenario, I'd rather just like to draw, uh, which is kind of a, a really important aspect of this deck too. Uh, you should look at the treasure as ways to like float mana or draw cards because those actually like really progress your game state opposed to just focusing on like like a cent I, I'm not running any of the treasuries that are more than one cost and so I think it's really like important to note that like it's not really relevant to have like a bunch of treasuries on the field so she can swing it's just really important to be able to get a lot of little ones on the field so you can keep doing a bunch of stuff with them um, so for the stones I have four of Kaguya's stone. Uh, this stone's actually really good and I love it going off and hitting a kimono. So when this card enters the field, you check the top two cards of your deck and then you can put them back in any order. Uh, this is of course amazing because Kaguya can then check the treasury item on top of your deck and add it to your hand. And then it kind of lets you know like what your next card is too, which I think is actually like a lot like more important than I thought it would be. Like a lot of times I feel like I was playing Shion where like I played my turn out because I know what I'm drawing and like that's a little bit more important than I, I wanted to give it credit for. Even when I like hit this and I miss somehow, and I know what two cards are coming up, and I like switch to order if I need to, it actually feels really, really good. And then for Light Vapors, um, Light is by far probably like the most important color in this deck. Um, I still have more blue than I do white because I feel as though uh, the playing the kimonos on like a tempo way kind of feel is still a little bit more important than anything else in the deck but white comes really close second. So I wanted a way to have as much white as I can. So I also have two gusting skies. So the only other alternative was to play four of these, four light vapors and two of Kaguya stone. And then that way I would have eight light, but I really didn't want to give up having more Kaguya stones because it really, really does feel helpful. Uh, there's a lot of times where uh, this has saved me by just letting me get to a treasury I needed. Whereas having six white still feels really good. So it was kind of, um, your kind of ratio for it is you have eight, eight blue and then six white 
and then six green so with the gusting skies and these so it was it was still pretty consistent i never really felt like i wanted more white but the deck definitely does play a lot of white cards so you kind of have to get used to the curve because like you can always float the blue or the green but you can't float white so it's really important to kind of like get used to playing the deck and not just like burning out on all of your white cards as fast as you can because you're typically supposed to leave that mana open to respond on your opponent's turn so it just seems and something you kind of have to get used to when playing the deck uh, but it, it could seem kind of complicated in the, in the beginning. And then for, um, for the Resonators anyway, I have four Will-O-Wisp. Um, this card is like my favorite card in the entire set. I don't know why I've been obsessed with this card. I try to play this card in literally every deck I play. It's like the kind of opposite of Space Sam Anomaly because it's like white-blue. But like my obsession with blue off-color stuff, it's like, like the Twilight version. Like the dark one is uh, Space Sam Anomaly and now this is my new obsession. This card is cool and it's really good and people totally underestimate how good this card is. Uh, the only thing of course that's bad about this card is the obvious it's a 1-1 one, one for 2 which is really poor stats. But it has barrier and when it enters the field you draw a card. So your opponent can't obviously target this for any of their effects. Uh, they can still attack it of course. But what makes it cool is its last effect which is when this card is dealt damage you heal that amount. And of course this doesn't seem like it would be relevant until you have at least three kimonos on it, which is really easy to get on the field. And so if you put three kimonos on this, this becomes a 1000-1000 that can block almost any threat outside of flyers and heal any damage it blocks. So your opponent can't use any spells to kill this, so the block is going to be successful. You're of course only blocking when you know, you know you're going to beat their monster for sure. You're not trying to block anything bigger. Unless, of course, you have four kimonos, in which case you can pretty much block anything, even like a skyscraper giant, because it becomes 17-17 as well. And it's just really good. Like, I wanted... I realized that the problem with the deck was essentially, if you're playing a bunch of additions, and your opponent just uses removal, then, like, you're not never going to get to, like, have your monster stay on board, even if it's really big. So I was like, okay, I want to play a deck where my opponent just can't respond to my additions going off and then just beat them down with monsters they can't respond to. So Will-O-Wisp was the obvious choice because of the built-in barrier. And then my only other um, barrier resonator is the flower. So the flower plays the same role and it comes with bigger stats. The only reason I liked the spirit a little bit more is the fact that she draws on enter. So if they do have some kind of global hate like and already set up skyscraper giant or anything that's kind of like a world flame summoning or something at least the spirit kind of drew me a card so it's not like making me fall behind but i wanted more ways to swing in bigger ways as well so the three seven on this body is a lot better especially because if you if you equip even only one kimono to this and it becomes four eight it makes it so it can block anything that you've bear magic successfully so that seems pretty cool too because you get to just essentially kill anything with bear magic in this if you you have even one kimono and then uh what makes this actually really cool is it is a treasury item i meant i don't run anything any treasure items more than one cost for like the additions but or yeah the additions uh but this is the only other monster i run that's a treasury item and then it's also really cool because uh kaguya can like tap this to gain effects of course so like if you're leaving it open to block and your opponent doesn't swing because they obviously know they can't get over it uh you get to then use kaguya to like you know, use it to float mana or draw a card or whatever, and then it's going to untap. So it, it, there's a lot of cool interactions between that. And then it's essentially like the kimonos, because like most people don't run addition hate. So the, of course the kimonos just sit there and like don't do anything. And your opponent can't really react to them. But all the other treasury monsters, like the bird and everything, uh, they would just get destroyed if you played them. But because this has barrier, it's really easy to like sit on the field. And then you could just use Kagi to gain multiple effects from that as well. And then the only other monster I run is Arthur. Um, this is essentially kind of like pseudo barrier, I guess, because the only removal that really works on this card is bear magic. And not a lot of people are playing bear magic at the moment, but what makes kind of Arthur a cool choice too is, um, if you do have a bunch of kimonos equipped onto Arthur and they bear magic him, the kimonos still like pump post bear magic. So let's say if you have three, bear, uh, three kimonos on him and they bear magic him, he still gains the like 12-12. And so he would be a 16-16. Of course, they wouldn't have to like attack into him anymore, which is like the whole point of playing the card. But it's a lot better than just losing to Bear Magic right away. So essentially, like uh, Arthur's just there to kind of deal with stuff like Wyvern and whatnot. I have other hate for for Flyers in general because I think that's the only thing that beats this deck. Uh, but like, it's kind of like you you really want to get to late game with this deck. 
and Kaguya can deal with anything late game because she could just ba uh, bounce all the flyers to their hand while like Sprite and this can block all the like grounded monsters. So um, you want anything that's going to help you get to late game and Arthur's a really good option for that. Um, he just sits on the board and they can't re uh, remove it and it just works really really well. And then for treasury items, I have, um, there's 12 of these for sure, but I run 12 of the kimono. Um, this card, you're never going to win with the, like, the effect where if you have 12 and you equip it to a monster, you automatically win. Uh, I've never pulled that off, but it doesn't matter. The reason why you play 12 of this is because it's so important to be able to just, like, use Kaguya's effects as fast as you can, and so, like, just one after another. Uh, there's so many times where, like, my hand is like nine cards after I draw because like I'm at seven, I draw for eight, and then I use Kagi's effect and I have nine, and then I have like four of these on the field, and then you can go like you know, play one, judgment Kagia, tap two, and then float a blue, play one, tap these down two, float a blue, play one, and then you just like it doesn't really feel like you're like falling behind on resource because you added them all to your hand for free anyway with Kaguya's ruler side and you should definitely mulligan any of these away though um sometimes i feel like i like keeping them but it, it really just depends like i have a lot of specific cards that deal with hard aggro matchups in this deck and you always want to play it safe and prepare for those matchups rather than prepare for control because like against control you have time to build up because you're not trying to like beat you really fast so it, you can get to late game against control but you should always kind of like mulligan preparing for aggro and then you know if it happens to be control you're fine because you have time but um definitely always mulligan any of these away uh you're always going to see more just because there's so many of them in the deck and um try to get like the answer cards first so cards like uh well i guess i'll get to them and then i'll talk about it but like i, I have removal in here which is really really important uh, the other treasury I run is Seal of Shining Bamboo. Uh, this is a TMS card and not, not a lot of people know it's a treasury item. The only downside to this card is of course if you like equip it to a resonator and then the resonator like leaves the field, this actually just like falls off instead of like being like kimono where it sits on the board uh, due to it being like one of the newer like bestow mechanic cards. But um, why I like this card still is that it's one of the only other ways to deal with cards like uh, Gwyber. Uh, if I equip this to a Gwyber and it can't attack, and they like use Guinevere to tribute Gliber now to like get over the fact that it can't attack. Like that, I'm I'm like totally cool with that because it's like my one white card still killed the Gliber technically. I don't care if they're gaining advantage from Guinevere because like had I used the removal that was one white that said like destroy target Gliber for example, they would have been able to like Guinevere that anyway. So putting this on really big resonators and having it like sit there is actually not that bad because your opponent can't really do anything to get over this card. And then it's really cool because like there's times where like I'll have like four kimonos, this and like a uh, the flower. So I have six and my opponent knows that means I can like tap three to draw, tap three to draw. And they don't want me to. So they'll like force try to get the resonator off the board just so I lose this. So I can't like go crazy. And then they think they like outplay you when they do that because you're losing your card. And then next turn you just like draw only one since you're at five and then you like drop like six kimonos and you're like oh okay i guess like that was pointless and i just lost my monster for nothing because the card can still block so it's not bad to keep but of course kaguya can bounce any blocker by her uh return to hand effect so um i, I really like this card it, it really helps you stall out the game and then the last treasury i run is the miracle millennia medicine uh this card's like a terrible horn uh, Horn of the Sacred Beast, but I do like that it's a treasury item, so not only do I get to like tap it and stuff, but when I check it on top of my deck, it goes to my hand. Uh, there was so many times where when I played Horn, uh, I would just like, everything. Horn was the one card I saw the most on top of my deck when I would flip with Kaguya's effect, and I never understood why, because now that I replaced the Horn with this, I never really see this, it's always something else, like a kimono, but like I know that the one time I do hit this, I'm like, alright, cool, it's not a horn, so, um, it, it, this shuffles only three cards back, but it's not bad, because like if you do go, like, horn essentially against control is played so that you don't deck out, and like you can loop the same card even with only two other cards in your deck anyway, so, as long as you're not decking out, it's fine, and then the fact that it's only one cost is really nice, because, I mean, horn is zero, but I mean, in the case of like, playing it and then tapping them for Kaguya's effects, it's really cost effective, so I actually really like playing one of those. It seems just like a little better than uh, relying on Horn. And then for the non-treasury chance, I have Amaterasu's Foresight. Uh, this is where the deck kind of gets to the complicated part, I guess. Everything you've seen so far is 
in like you want to build up to everything I've shown now uh, to the Kaguya control to the flower and the spirit being barrier uh, being able to actually start swinging in with all of those buffs you want to be able to get to that point in the game because against aggro you won't have the time to and so the only way I can see that is with like the last engine kind of part of the deck so Amaterasu's Foresight says prevent all damage you would take. It's essentially just a fog. You take no damage that turn. It helps you get to your next turn of just tapping for a stone and progressing your game state. If you can stall enough against aggro and then drop an Arthur, it's actually just game. Like most aggro decks just can't get over Arthur. And so there's actually a lot of times where cards like this are really good because you'll have four mana and an Arthur in hand. You obviously can't play it. And it's going to be game next turn. So... They do all their stuff, you Foresight, and then you tap your stone, you drop the Arthur, and then, like, tapping Arthur enough, just, I mean, just once with, like, a kimono on it, or, like, well, two two or three kimonos, preferably, but, like, a whole board of aggro would just die to that one Arthur, so, um, this is a really, really good card in this deck, it's the only thing that really helps you stall out, other than Shining Strike. Uh, another TMS card, uh, this card is actually worded the way I wish every Four Solo card was worded, uh, which actually kind of upsets me, but... Um, the reason why I like Shining Strike so much is it says you choose one, you rest either a Resonator and draw a card, or if your ruler has Kaguya in its name, you rest a J slash Resonator and draw a card. And so why this card is so good is if you have literally just your first stone, let's say you tap, and it's this, and your opponent went first and they have Persia and they have like a Sacred Elf and two Regalia, and they go like J activate, and you know, swing. You would most likely just take the first hit because you want them to waste the god art and then they go god art recover persia attempt to swing and then you shining strike uh you did take at least like 1400 or you know 2000 if it's like the real otk and so you're already at half but at this point you have no worry that your spirit's going to be able to block persia from now on because she doesn't have flying and you're going to be healing all that amount back you have all the time to start building up with just that one play and it just helps you deal with any of the aggressive options while still being nice because like there's times where like you have a shining strike and they have a blocker on the field and you just like shining strike on draw recover and then play like two more kimonos when you have like three and then you equip all five onto like your spirit and swing for 2000 and like they could possibly just be at 2000 already and it just wins the game so uh shining strike is definitely really good i would play four uh but like i said white there's only six of in this deck and i didn't want to lose out on the kaguya stone so i'm trying really at this point kind of carefully to not play too many white cards because i don't want to have to wait on all the white mana uh so i, I thought amato's foresight was a little bit more important because it's a guarantee just don't die from anything instead of from one but i still really like the aspect that like this card just does so much like it just, just it's so good and then uh three gale force uh, this is main, which seems kind of crazy, but I've actually been telling everyone that I think this card is super necessary in this format, uh, until I think, like, the recent GP that happened, it wasn't the, the latest one, I think it was Texas, or no, it was Montreal, so the Ryan brothers, uh, mained this, and I was telling everyone I knew to main this, and people were telling me, no, it's a side card, don't main it, and nobody kind of listened to me, and now that they kind of went to a regional and put it on the radar, uh, people are starting to main it again. Well, I guess people are trying to main it in general, but um, this card is really good because, okay, like let's look at the matchup. So if you're going to play against a tier deck, your options are Feetsing Turbo, which has Gwyber, Titania, or Drake, all flyers, uh, Gil Alamut, who plays mainly Blazer as their win condition outside of Observation, and Blazer's a flyer, so it's an out to that. If you play against Persia, she gives everything flying, so it's an out to that. Um... Those are typically like the top three decks, and but like just in general, like everything, maybe other than I guess the Stone OTK Arla deck, which kind of sucks to play against no matter what because it's kind of like janky. Um, other than that deck, I don't think that deck has any flyers, but almost every deck you play against is going to have flyers, and this being a dead card in your hand against any other deck is still worth not having it against all the decks it does play really well against like if they don't have flyers then you're like um this engine is beating them anyway because they can't get over the fact that this is too huge and it's blocking everything this is too huge and it's blocking everything this is healing this is forcing all the attacks so if if they don't have flyers you're doing okay even with this being dead in your hand because you just add so many cards in your hand but if you play against flyers this these can't do anything and if you can't remove the flyer then it's just game so 
I think Gale Force is still really important because it's very low cost removal. Uh, I, I, you can argue that you'd want to play more Bear Magic, but the thing is, is that Bear Magic just doesn't do what Gale Force does because it is really nice to be able to block anything with like this and uh, Water Transformation when there's even only two on this because because it could, uh, because it becomes a five five. Sorry, uh, so that's still like really successful with the Flower or with this. Uh, it still works really well to like get late game threats out of the way, but um, the, the the reason why Gale Force is good is because Gale Force works really early on, whereas this works when I've already set up a board, and like I said, I'm trying to get to late game in this deck, so I need as much stuff to deal with early threats as I can, so that getting to late game isn't an issue. And then lastly, I play two Millennia Bond, this is the last two cards of the deck. Um, this card, um, you can... You can argue that you might want to play Seal instead. I really, really, really considered it. But once again, like, what I like about this card is if I'm tapped out on mana and my opponent tries to, like, play a threat like Heavenly Gust or Lumia's Judgment, I can still float the mana to use this, whereas I would have to have the one white open to do it with Seal because she can't float white, which can sometimes get really frustrating. And with the white being, like, I... I figured I don't have too many problems with resonators because I have so much ways to remove them with Gale Force and Water Transformation and my big resonators and stuff and like Arthur or Bounce them that it wasn't necessary to have the counterspell for the resonators but it was necessary to stop spells because the reason why I don't like the first moon in this deck and why I think it's completely irrelevant to play is if you have two first moons even on the field you're only preventing Heavenly Gust. If you have one on the field, you're still preventing Heavenly Gust as like just the first moon would be destroyed and then everything else would stay alive and like of course what are the chances that they're gonna like double Heavenly Gust you for like Torrent which is like probably not gonna happen but Lumia's Judgment has been a really big card in the control matchup and if if my answer to Lumia's Judgment would be this card or Seal of Wind and Light or like a counterspell in general, then there's no reason of why. Like if I have two moons on the field, Lumia's Judgment is wiping my board anyway. So if I have to still use counterspells to stop Lumia's Judgment, why wouldn't my argument just be that the same two counterspells would stop the Heavenly Gust? Like it's the same scenario. And so it doesn't make sense for me to try to use the moons early to prevent just Heavenly Gust and still lose the Judgment when I could just play the counterspells and deal with both. And um, the reason why I did like this over Seal as well is when you counter a spell and the draw that you get from this card, um, it's really relevant because you never want your hand to be going down. You're already using a lot of cards that could potentially kind of like kill your curve like Amaterasu's Foresight and stuff because you're essentially just like losing a card instead of doing something with it, like removing a threat. And Shining Strike replaces itself, but like you're just happy down there monsters, so like you still need to be able to do something about it. So... I like that this card kind of keeps filling up my hand because I, I need to get to my plays as fast as I can so I can keep stalling my opponents so that I can set up and win. Uh, I just, you could try to run the seals instead, but I think this card's really good. Um, it just stops more of the threats that I don't want, like Observation and uh, Lumia's Judgment, Heavenly Gust. It stops the cards that I'm actually worried about, whereas like Seal would as well, but I, I just think that I can get a little bit more greedy on like playing more tempo-y and tapping out on my mana and just hoping i mean well, relying on kaguya to float this mana and use this card instead of always having to be like one white open for all of my cards so uh you can definitely try out the seal um i like millennia bond and then the, the second effect i guess is like kind of a plus because there there is times where i like put a water kimono into the field after because i have like a kaguya and the spirit so i have a green and a blue and so it triggers the second effect but like it's never like the most relevant thing so like it, it, that that argument doesn't really like do anything so it's, it has nothing to do with the second effect it's like it's nice but it's not like crazy or anything but yeah i just i, I like this over seal just because strictly of the the mana it just makes more sense so thanks for watching guys i really hope you enjoyed the deck profile this is one of the most fun decks i've played in like a really long time it's just a really good time and it feels super fun and super interactive so i really hope you guys enjoy playing it if you have any questions about the deck just make sure to leave it in the comment section below the description will have like the whole list i'm also going to add like a possible side or side options you should be looking to in the description i didn't want to invest the time into like making one just because i know everyone's locals are just so different 
and I it doesn't really seem relevant to be like oh like this is what you should play when like that might not help you at your locals so instead what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna list a bunch of cards that I would typically side against certain matchups and I'll kind of put like you know this card for this deck and this card for this deck and then you guys can determine like how many of those cards you think are good or like how you want to take those cards and put them into your side so um, that'll be in the description as well on the bottom of the deck list and if you guys have any other comments to leave unrelated to the deck you can leave that too it doesn't matter I love interacting with you guys so just let me know and I'll definitely catch you guys next time